Well, hello and welcome to this third webinar on new approaches in chemical assessment co-organized by my organization, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, the PETA International Science Consortium, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. I'm Christy Sullivan, and I'm here with Amy Klippinger and Gino Scarano from EPA. Um, just a bit of housekeeping first. Uh, the webinar is recorded. You will be able to access the slides and uh, the recording on the Science Consortium website, which you can see on your screen here within a few days. Your lines are muted. If you would like to ask a question, please type your question into the question module or the question panel during the presentations. Don't use the chat box, please, unless you um, are having some sort of technical issue we might be able to help you with. So again, type your questions into the question module during the presentation presentations and then we'll read it uh, during the Q&A period which will be after both presenters finish. So today we are very pleased to be able to host two experts in the development of toxicological approaches. Um, our first presenter is Dr. Steve Enoch. He is a reader in computational toxicology at Liverpool John Moores University in the United Kingdom. He's a chemist with expertise in the development of structural or alert-based profilers and their use in regulatory toxicology. He has contributed to a wide range of international projects, including developing four of the profilers in the current version of the OECD QSAR toolbox, one of which being for respiratory sensitization. Our second presenter is Dr. Arno Gutliff. He graduated from the University of Veterinary Medicine, Vienna, Austria, and holds a PhD in environmental sciences with specialization in toxicology from Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And he's also a European registered toxicologist. He is a distinguished professor at the University Luliu Had Shaigenu in Cluj, Romania, and a visiting professor at the Universidad Andres Beo, Santiago de Chile. Currently, he's group leader in environmental health at the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology. So as you can see on your screen, uh, they will present, be presenting work and information on strategies for determining the respiratory sensitization potential of chemicals. Dr. Enoch will be presenting chemistry-based approaches for identifying respiratory sensitizers. And Dr. Gutlib will be presenting in vitro models to identify respiratory sensitizers. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to Dr. Enoch. Okay, thank you, Christy. Um, so everyone should be able to see my screen now. Um, so I'm gonna talk about chemistry-based identification. Um, I'm gonna start with a discussion of the, the OECD QSAR, uh, the profiler in the QSAR toolbox and how that was developed. And then I'll touch on some usage of the DPRA assay work by John Lalko and, and, and co-workers. So let's talk about that, um, that profiler that's in the, in the QSAR toolbox. We did some work now looking at, at a data set provided to us uh, by colleagues at the University of Manchester. And that data set really thinks about respiratory sensitization in terms of low molecular weight organic chemicals. And we, we know roughly that things like diacetyl cyanide cause respiratory sensitization. One of the problems we have when we're developing a chemistry-based approach and a computational approach is that we don't have a great deal of standard test data to build our, our profiler from. If you think about the work done for skin sensitization, we've always got the local lymph node assay data to work from. So what we entered into with our collaboration with our colleagues in, in Manchester was to look at cases, case reports from the, um, from the clinical literature of occupational asthma. Now, occupational asthma covers respiratory sensitization, but it also covers things like irritation and other, other endpoints. Now, in terms of the local lymph node assay and, and the regulatory environment, of course, you can think that skin and respiratory sensitization are linked, but the local lymph node assay, if you were to use that to identify respiratory sensitizers, you get an awful lot of false positives because not all skin sensitizers are respiratory sensitizers. So how are we going to pick these things apart? Well, we start to think about um, RAOP, an RAOP that was published by Christy and myself and, and a number of co-workers. 
starts to think about the molecular initiating event in terms of the covalent binding of low molecular weight chemicals to, to proteins in the lung and the skin, it's important to consider the skin as the root of, of, of induction. And here we're thinking about low molecular weight in terms of less than a thousand grams per mole. Once you get very big, the molecular initiating event can change. You can get different, different effects. Here we're thinking about covalent bond formation, analogous to that that we've seen with skin sensitization. So that's the AOP. I'll come back to some of the evidence that will help us build our profile in a few slides' time. In terms of that data set from our colleagues in Manchester, they provide us with a data set of over 100 organic chemicals that have been linked, and linked an important word, with occupational asthma. These are clinical reports from the, from the, from the medical literature. The problem with a lot of these things is that you have chemicals that are not confirmed in any kind of bronchial challenge test, and that's the gold standard a physician would consider to be a proof of occupational asthma. The other big challenge with this data set is that when you look at it, you start to see a number of, a number of clear irritants that are listed in the data set. So for example, when we inspected the chemistry of this data set, we noticed a number of acids. Clearly these things are not true sensitizers, they're gonna behave as irritants. Our colleagues in Manchester also provided us with a set of 82 control chemicals. They identified these as being unlikely to cause respiratory sensitization by researching the, the literature around them to see whether there, any, whether there are any reports of occupational asthma. So we've got a data set of about 100 chemicals and 80 controls, and we use this to build a profiler. Now, a profiler consists of structural alerts, structural alert being a fragment related to the chemistry around the MIE. For respiratory sensitization, we're thinking about covalent protein binding to lysine. And what we did in, the, in our development is, is me and my colleague, Dave Roberts, we looked through that data set with, uh, with our chemistry heads on, thinking about where's the chemistry that would predict where these chemicals can bind to, to proteins, specifically lysine. It's really a chemistry-driven approach. And we're thinking about can those, can those alerts distinguish those sensitizers from the non-sensitizers? And I wouldn't be giving this presentation if, if, if the answer to that question wasn't yes. These alerts are in the QSAR toolbox. They're in there as a profiler that's in the current version, so you can access the alerts right now. Let's think about the structure activity of these alerts. I'm not gonna talk through each alert individually. That would, be, that would be too tiresome. But let's think about the structure activity of what we discovered when we looked at that data set. Classically, what people think is for respiratory sensitization, you need multiple functional groups in order for cross-linking to happen. And we certainly saw that. We saw, if you look at the top of this screen, the ones that say low reactivity, no cross-linking, there are a number of chemicals in the control set that have been linked with perhaps skin sensitizers that could react with proteins, but were relatively low in terms of their reactivity. So slow to react with proteins. Things like mono-shift base formers as shown there. Those chemicals are not reported as being respiratory sensitizers. As we step through the data set to the middle set that you can see, things like glutaraldehyde are still fairly low reactivity, but they're capable of cross-linking proteins. And that seems to push these chemicals across what we consider to be a reactivity threshold and make them sensitizers. So we, we start to see quite quickly that things that can cross-link multiple functional groups capable of covalent uh, protein binding are likely to be respiratory sensitizers. The third group that we saw at the bottom of this slide were a series of chemicals that are high reactivity. So they're very, very reactive towards proteins. They can't cross-link, but they are shown to react with proteins and they are linked with respiratory sensitization. And here the example on the slide is an anhydride. It, 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 it can react to as, as shown. So we've got this sort of general structure activity that we took forward in our analysis. What you see when you, when you look at the summary of the alerts, this is just a summary slide, again, I'm not gonna to talk to each individual alert, is you start to see things like the domains that you have, these are the types of chemistry that can happen, the sorts of reactions. The acylation domain, which is the anhydride example, is well populated. Michael addition, which is 
very, very well populated for skin sensitization is less populated. And what we saw with the microaddition chemicals, it was only microacceptors that were very, very reactive towards proteins that could cause sensitization of the respiratory tract. Shift base formation was very well populated, as were SN2 as we go down, down this table. For the chemists that are listening, this is really linked to hard, soft acid base theory. Hard electrophiles were very dominant in the, in the data set. And this makes sense because lysine is a hard nucleophile. You can see with the table at the bottom that the alert set were able to distinguish the sensitizers from, from the control set with, with some good, with some, uh, as, as you can see. Now, part of the problem with the data set is the confidence that you have in the alert. The data set is drawn from clinical uh, reports in the literature. Many of those clinical reports were for a single chemical. This is problematic when you're developing a profile. You want to have confidence that the alert relates to more than a single example. What we see when we look across the alert set is we see certain groups of chemistries are very well represented, and, and some of the examples are on this slide. There are a number of alerts for anhydrides and, and ring opening reactions. Um, the SNAR, cyanic chloride chemical there, that can cross-link proteins, et cetera, et cetera. And what we see on, on this slide is examples where we're very confident that the chemistry is well represented in the data set. So diacyanides, dialdehydes, cyanoacrylate, reactive dyes. These are all very, very well populated. There's good evidence in the literature that these things are sensitizers. However, there are a number of, of the alerts where there's much less evidence. And one of the important aspects of a profiler in the data that's in the toolbox is your ability to look at the metadata. The metadata lets you see the, the evidence that was developed, the evidence behind the alert and the sort of supporting information that, that was developed that allowed us to build the alert. So we'll look at two examples, and these were just selected because both of these examples, there's only one chemical in the data set from which the alert was developed. The example on the left-hand side, um, if we look down to the references at the bottom, we can see that the, 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 the metadata gives you information about the mechanism, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The number of chemicals that were in the data set, and importantly, the number of references that support the alert. And for the chemical on the left-hand side, as you look at it, um, you can see there's only, only two references, one of which is the alert reference itself. There's relatively the small amount of support for this alert. You wouldn't have huge amounts of confidence with this particular alert, although there is evidence for it. The alert on the right-hand side of the screen, again, there's only one chemical associated with this in the data set, but there's quite a number of reports of chemicals containing this type of alert in the wider literature. And this starts to build your confidence that this alert is perhaps very well associated with respiratory sensitization. So if you're going to use the profiler, it's very important to drill into the metadata to see the alert that you've, that's been flagged and the support that goes with it. Now, we're trying to improve our confidence in the structure alert set with some ongoing work uh, with, a, with a group led by Christy and some other, some other co-workers. And what we're doing in that work is we're trying to develop the, the underlying evidence from the AOP in support of each of the alerts. So you can imagine we're trying to pull the, the AOP evidence for each of the alerts in the data set and try and allow ourselves to perhaps remove some of the alerts and give where, where, there, where there's not a lot of evidence for them and make build confidence in the sets of alerts where there is more, to give ourselves a bit more confidence around the biology linked in the AOP. And that's ongoing work. Now, you might think, and we certainly thought that um, vapor pressure might be an, an important distinguisher for, for respiratory sensitizers. And we've certainly used vapor pressure to rationalize skin sensitization potency previously. We've looked at acrylates, they're very reactive. They tend to be fairly weak skin sensitizers. And that's because they're volatile in the local lymph node assay. We looked at this in terms of respiratory sensitization. Would volatility give us any measurement of, dis of, of discrimination? What we found was this is not the case. This slide here shows a selection of, of respiratory sensitizers with, um, with vapor pressure taken from EpiSuite. The values in parentheses are the log to base 10 value of, of the vapor pressure you can see. What we considered previously is anything with a positive log value, 
uh, so the, the value of 0.72 to be um, to be volatile. We've used that in skin sensitization analysis previously. And you can see here that the volatilities of these chemicals, which are all respiratory sensitizers, vary greatly. And we don't see any, any ability to use vapor pressure as a way to distinguish uh, uh, respiratory sensitizers. I'm going to finish uh, with the next five or so minutes talking about the use of the DPRA and some of the work by John Lalco and colleagues where they've looked at the ratio of lysine to cysteine uh, reactivity from the DPRA assay. And they've done some really nice work looking at the preference of respiratory sensitizers versus skin sensitizers. And the reaction conditions are as given on the slide. These are just the standard conditions of the DPRA. So if we look at this data, and this is taken from one of, of, of John's papers, you can see on the left, you've got skin sensitizers. They clearly have a preference for cysteine, that's what those, those dots down towards the bottom are. A lysine-cysteine ratio of one to one appears to be a turning point. And as we see the respiratory sensitizers, those up at the top have a high preference for lysine. So the top set, the anhydrides, you can see that they're very reactive. They have a complete preference for lysine. And they're clear uh, respiratory sensitizers um, when you're looking to distinguish. As you go down the set, you can see things get a little bit more murky as we get towards a one-to-one -one ratio. And then we've got a whole set of the diisocyanides that if you're using this ratio on its own, you wouldn't identify. You would suggest they're probably going to be skin sensitizers uh, alone. If you're thinking about that ratio of above one, if a chemical has a preference for lysine, it's going to be a respiratory sensitizer. Unfortunately, this set here in the red box sort of fall away from that and are, are well below this one-to-one -one cutoff. Now, what we've been thinking about is if you apply the alerts and the structure activity knowledge, can you build confidence that this set here have something about them that might push them towards also being respiratory sensitizers? And what you see is if you apply the SAR knowledge that we have in the profiler, it's very clear there's a reason why these chemicals, could, they're relatively low reactivity, but they can also cause respiratory sensitization. So you apply the SAR knowledge, what you start to see is that these things, are, they can cross-link, they have an alert for quinone or quinonamine, they have some unusually hard reactivity, and all of these chemicals, you can understand them in terms of their SAR. So if you combine the DPRA data with the profiling data and the SAR in the profiling data, those two things combined can give you a really good handle on, on separating respiratory from skin sensitization. As an example, if we just look at some data that I pulled together here, we've got a 2,4-DNCB. Its cysteine preference is 100%, not very reactive towards lysine. So the ratio is 0.2, well below that cutoff of one. It doesn't contain an alert. It doesn't meet any of our criteria that we have in our, in our profiler. You wouldn't think it's a, a respiratory sensitizer. It is a skin sensitizer. Benzoquinone, I pulled this as an example of sort of reactive dye type chemistry, similar to quinonamines. This has a one-to-one -one ratio, 99 in the cysteine, 91 in lysine, 0.9 ratio. So on that sort of gray zone, we have an alert in our profiler for this. You would predict this is likely to be a respiratory sensitizer because it's got good lysine reactivity. Thioxol similar, the ratio is again 1.2. We have an alert that seems to push ourselves. This thing can cross-link proteins that would push it towards likely being a respiratory sensitizer. The final example is this fluorescein isothiocyanite. This has a preference for cysteine, has the isocyanite group, but that's a really unreactive group towards lysine or relatively compared to the cysteine choice. We don't have an alert for this because you need um, multiple functionality for this sort of chemistry, so we wouldn't predict this to be a sensitizer. So you can see how we can start to use a combination of the two pieces of information to, to discriminate between the two uh, endpoints. So in conclusion, what have we got? We've got a set of structural alerts for respiratory sensitization. These are in the OECD QSAR toolbox. It's important that you inspect the metadata because the data set from which they were developed is from human clinical data and there's a lot of uncertainty around the clinical report. For some areas of chemistry, we're very confident. Others, we've built alerts based on one or two chemicals. We are addressing this confidence though with current ongoing work.
I think we've shown that chemicals that cause respiratory sensitization don't necessarily need to be highly volatile, certainly in terms of using epi suite. And we've also seen that um, work by John Lauko's group um, and, and others have shown that DPRA is pretty useful in identifying potential respiratory sensitizers. And we believe if you combine that with the SAR knowledge in, in the profiler, you can improve some of that, those zones around the sort of cutoff that's been suggested between that ratio. There just remains me to show you the references. These are the references. If anyone's interested, I can pass them out, of course. And then, as, as always, some acknowledgments. Our colleagues at the University of Manchester, both physicians, for the painstaking effort of collecting the human clinical data, never to be underestimated. My colleague here in Liverpool, um, Dave Roberts, who helped with some of the initial chemical work, uh, chemistry work, and the EU for the funding of the research in the first place. And that's everything from me. Okay, well, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, really compelling ongoing work and some great advice that people can use today. Um, so we're going to move uh, to Dr. Gillip's presentation. And as soon as his slides are up, we'll be able to hear that. Okay, so Dr. Gutlib, take it away. Okay, Moyen, as we say in Luxembourg. Hello, everybody. I will, uh, in approximately the same time, uh, guide you through two in vitro assays and give some introduction in the beginning. Uh, I will shortly explain why uh, people working on cell-based assays prefer human cells versus mouse cells. I will compare a little bit the in vivo anatomy with the, what I call the in vitro anatomy. How do we build the cell assays so that they mimic um, the physiological state? I will shortly talk about air liquid interface cell culture and then on how to characterize a model, some standards of testing. And then I will present uh, two essays that are quite far developed and give some outlook for the future. So when we talk about models for the lung, um, we have to define where we are, where we want to go. You can think about having 2D cultures, mixed cultures. Uh, you can culture cells in a 3D system. You can use several cell lines. You still may use uh, rodents, for example. There is a possibility to use human lungs, precision cut slices. And the further you come on the right side, we usually assume that the costs increase, the complexity increases, but also maybe the physiological relevance. Um, the question is also how do we expose? And uh, we talk about uh, when we talk about assays for the lung, usually to expose cells at the air liquid interface. The reason for this is simple. If you think about the lung, it is simply not an organ that is under the level of medium. This is in fact a drowning state, but the lung cells are made to stay at the air liquid interface. Uh, a second reason simply is if you go away from chemicals to particles, you immediately get interaction of particles with cell culture medium and what you expose in a submerged system has no relevance for an in vitro system. You also see that there's a big difference between a mouse and a human airway. Uh, in the center, you see an approximate size comparison. Of course, the mouse lung is much smaller. You also see on the left side that especially the alveolar region is very different from the alveolar region in humans. It's shorter, it's more uh, circular uh, compared to humans. You can imagine that the difference in the size of the leading airways, the pipes, has an influence on the aerodynamics, meaning also coming back to particles. The particles in the mouse lung are deposited in different areas than in the human lung. So generally, we assume that human um, cannot be mimicked by uh, rodent in vivo assays when it comes to particles. When we talk about the lung anatomy, you all know you have the trachea and then this system of pipes becomes uh, thinner and thinner. You get more and more branches and you end up with the alveolar re region where you have the gas exchange. Now the lung also has different um, functions. 
One is, of course, to lead the air uh, in the, into the lung, uh, CO2 out. You have the chillin in the trachea and the large bronchi that move out things. Once it comes to the alveolar region, you have only macrophages that can clean up. When you think about effects of chemicals, the large airways usually you will see irritation, inflammation. Uh, the same is true, of course, for the alveolar region, but it's also the, the size, not exclusively, but it's the site of the main part where the sensitization takes place. So generally how are in vitro systems currently um, organized? You see on the left side uh, one in vitro model for aerosol exposure. You see in the transwell insert epithelial cells uh, mimicking the inside of the alveolar, uh, alveoli themselves. You see endothelial cells and then you may have immune cells such as mast cells, macrophages, etc. On the right side, you see the in vivo histology, which is quite similar. You have uh, alveolar type 1 and type 2 cells. You have the capillary cells, and of course, there are a uh, few uh, immune cells. Important is that both the in vivo situation and the in vitro situation can have surfactant, which of course is protecting the cells from drying, but also interacts with any chemical or particle that will come into the airways. Again, I've said it before, having lung cells under cell culture medium is not very physiological. That's why we always prefer to work at the air liquid interface. When it comes to the air liquid interface, and I hope you can see the arrow of my mouse now, um, you have to um, validate your system. You have to see that each of the cells does what they, it is put to in vivo. Now on the Upper part, you see something in green on the lower left quadrant of these four pictures. This is an immune staining of the histamine in the HMC1, the histamine producing cell line. And you see these cells produce histamine in the cell culture conditions we have. In the next panel, you see uh, in green marked CD11B. This is a marker for mature macrophages and uh, you see that these macrophages express the surface marker that they are expected to have. And this lower part picture shows in fact that it is a complete uh, B layer of cells. Uh, you have a, com uh, a complete monolayer on each side of the transwell. In larger magnification, I want to show you also that the A509 cells, the epithelial cells, produce surfactant. Surfactant is necessary that the cells can uh, be cultured at the air uh, liquid interface. And you see again in green the staining for surfactant protein A. You see a little bit of surfactant protein B. And you see in green the staining for surfactant protein C. So we do have surfactant. But take care, this is surfactant within the cell, which means it's not protecting from drying. However, once you lift the cells at the air liquid interface, and you culture them like this, these cells uh, transport the surfactant proteins that we saw on the previous slide in the cytoplasm to the surface. How do we prove this? It's very easy because you uh, have a specific dye with a, uh, with a blue color and dependent on the surface tension, it either makes a very small uh, droplet like you see on the alveolar cells or it simply distributes over a large share phase in the case of the endothelial cells. This shows that there is surfactant on the outside of our transwell. Macrophages. They are supposed to phagocytose uh, particles. What you see here is, again, a laser scanning microscopy picture. We have exposed uh, silica rhodamine uh, labeled nanoparticles. We sprayed them on the cells. We waited a certain period. And what you see on the picture is in red and blue simply cells. In green, this is again the CD11B. These are mature macrophages. And you see white spots in some of them, like here and here in larger magnification. These are silica particles that were uh, phagocytosed by the macrophages. You also observe that nowhere there are white spots outside these green marked cells which is normal because A509 are not expected to perform phagocytosis. This is a video that hopefully works, yes. What you see here is a single macrophage uh, on top of the 
epithelial cell layer, and within the macrophage that is marked in green, CD11B, as we said before, you see the rhodamine labeled greenish uh, nanoparticles uh, that are ac accumulating. So this macrophage was clearly uh, phagocytosing on the surface of the transvel. So now when we come to testing, uh, and we talk about specifically on respiratory sensitization, how is testing done? It's usually done still in vivo. Uh, it's partly obliged by the uh, legal system for chemical registration. Uh, so companies will perform an LNA assay. And in addition to the ethical question, the costs uh, and the fact that they have to do it, we know that it's not very well working. There are too many false positives, too many false negatives. So it's a bad model. On the other hand, if you go back three, four, five years, you will uh, see that there was practically no in vitro model available. And I will describe you today the situation as we have it. When it comes to sensitization testing, there are some aspects, and uh, the speaker before has already mentioned, there's the direct peptide reactivity assay. And us coming from the biology, we have a tendency to say that it's not very well working for respiratory sensitization, um, while it is better working for skin sensitization. The reason is there, to our opinion, too many false positives, false negatives in the system. Some people tried uh, to use the h cloud assay, which is an assay developed for skin sensitization, also for respiratory sensitizers. And again, uh, many of the classic respiratory sensitizers give false positive uh, or false negative results in the h cloud assay. We have the mouse that we don't want to do. And that's the situation today. In fact, there are two models available and pu published uh, for which uh, patents have been also approved. There's the guard assay from a Swedish company, Sensagen, that I will show you in the next slides. And there's another assay developed at least in Luxembourg that I also will uh, introduce with a few slides. Um, so if you think about models for chemical irritants and sensitizers, and you have seen in the previous presentation also the AOP, you, it's very uh, visible that the uh, dendritic cells in the lung have a major role in the whole story. And that's also why actually both assays, the guard air from Sensagen and the assay from Luxembourg, use the lung dendritic cells as one of the major uh, readout uh, producing cells. Uh, coming to the GART uh, platform, uh, it's a pleasure also to say that the company uh, provided me these slides. So they're not taken from the internet, but they were given to me by the company. Uh, what you see is a dendritic cell. That's what they also use in their system. And the dendritic cell is the cell that uh, will first recognize uh, uh, the chemicals and then pass this information to other cells. Dependent on which cells are involved, it will be either respiratory sensitization or skin sensitization, and the guard platform is able to take, the, take this up. It was a quite a large project that is still ongoing. It's funded under the, the European Commission as a flagship project in the product health, and um, they are supposed to develop and further develop this predictive in vitro assay to identify respiratory sensitizers and bring it to the market. How did they work? Uh, you see a reference, uh, 2015, and they made a kind of AOP. They developed their biological system, and very important, then they used a training data set of known sensitizers and non-sensitizers, but it was including skin sensitizers, and that's important. And their endpoints are genomic-based. So they have a set of uh, slightly more than 50 genes. And based on the results of up or down regulation of these genes, the set of genes they can distinguish with their in-house developed algorithm sensitizers or skin sensitizers from uh, respiratory sensitizers. Uh, it's based as, uh, as uh, all modern essays on the understanding of the AOPs. And here again, the, the central key event is the activation of the dendritic cells. And then uh, just one example, this was their test uh, assay. They have a very high accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity, much better than all the other assays that were uh, used before. 
and um, there is a small number of, um, of respiratory sensitizers giving the positive signals and non-respiratory sensitizers giving negative signals in their assay. Now coming to the system that we developed here in Luxembourg, it's a, a kind of more complex system. Uh, it's a, we call it an alveolus in the transwell. We have four cell lines uh, placed within the transwell, mimicking the alveolar region. Sorry, and we have epithelial cells, endothelial cells, uh, macrophages, and dendritic cells in the system. And this is now uh, a few uh, data to show you. And you see, for example, on the left side for the fax measurement, the respiratory irritants such as acrolein um, give a decrease of a certain surface marker, while uh, known respiratory sensitizers give an increase of a certain uh, surface marker. And this is uh, true for another surface marker. While when you look to the cytokine pattern, acrolein is inducing um, a kind of inflammatory reactions while the respiratory sensors don't do this. And then we have a set of genes that also up or down regulated. And if you zoom in on this panel, we have defined currently a set of uh, 11 endpoints from cell surface markers, some cytokines and some uh, important genes. And then you see that chemical sensitizers give a different reaction than chemical irritants. And interestingly, also protein sensitizers have a different pattern in this set of 11 endpoints compared to the chemical uh, sensitizers and the chemical irritants. So coming to our model, uh, how, how does it work if you think about house dust mite, pollen, etc., that we have tested? We are careful, we say it works, but the results are promising. Uh, respiratory irritants give a clear pattern of results, and so do the respiratory sensitizers. And there is a clear difference between irritants and sensitizers. Uh, this model is uh, available now as a six-well format, uh, both for irritation and for sensitization, and also uh, in a 24-well format to be used. I will show you in one slide how do uh, we expose uh, in the community cells to uh, chemicals? Uh, there's one uh, provider that has developed a cloud chamber. You put your, I will not talk over the video. You saw in the injector you, put your chemical, there's an electric uh, current, the membrane starts to uh, shake and small droplets are produced. And by this you expose your cells to a, to a cloud of, oops, to a cloud of chemicals and they are equally distributed. So when we come uh, to the conclusions, how is the current standard of, of assays? We said, okay, there is a problem with the in vivo models that we all know. There was nothing in vitro some years ago. Now there are at least two models available that work for chemical sensitizers, probably also for protein sensitizers and also definitely for chemical irritants. Everything, of course, is work in progress. I also want to finish to thank my team, to thank the funding agencies, the industrial collaborations we have, and say with this, merci vielmals from Luxembourg. Great, thank you, Arno. Um, so for the next 20 minutes or so, we have time for questions. Um, so please go ahead and type them in to the question panel if you haven't already, and we'll read them out here. Um, the first one we have comes from William Irwin at the EPA. He asks, what about diacrylates and diperoxides potential for respiratory sensitization. Uh, if this question goes to uh, me, we have not tested it, so I cannot say anything on it. 
I would suggest that Dai Aquilates because uh, they would cross-link and have multiple types of protein reactivity. I, in my in my structure activity model, they would then be flagged up as potential sensitizers because of that cross-linking thought process. Um, what was the other chemical class, Christy? It was the diacrylates and the diperoxides. Don't know about peroxides, to be honest. We haven't we haven't seen any peroxides in any of the data sets in the data that we've looked at. Um, but certainly that that diacrylates. Once you're into cross-linking, that that's a bit of a flag in the structure activity. So they're a classic case of rel. You know they're quite reactive as it is, and you'd be I think you'd be concerned. What I can add to this is technically there is a problem in doing the at least at the air liquid interface the exposure to these compounds because they have the tendency to form yeah how to say um, they react with each other and they clog uh, this membrane. Yeah, yeah, they'll definitely polymerize. The diacrylates will definitely polymerize. Absolutely. And one membrane is 400 euros, so it's quite expensive to try to simply polymerize your membranes. Okay, there's another question here. Is there an opportunity to understand the threshold for induction of respiratory sensitization with these assays? And this question, I think we, we both uh, have been asked. And as far as I know, we both are working on, let's say, trying to identify potencies. But by today, at least for for Luxembourg, I cannot say that we are able to answer the question yet. I, I think it's an, in, I'd, I'd agree with that statement. It's an interesting question. And from a chemistry point of view, you're into that whole reactivity you know how, how what's the rate of chemical reaction is probably the bit that chemistry could help you with and again cross-linking so you know you saw chemicals things that are very reactive have a very fast rate of reactivity and i suspect that would be would give you some information towards the, the sort of you know the, the level of induction that you need to meet we've certainly published on reactivity in the past and given some indication of that we think there might be a reactivity threshold, but it will be a piece of evidence, not not the only piece you'd need. You certainly need some in vitro support. But the DPRA doesn't give you that information, unfortunately. It's very much a depletion assay. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, what role does chemical transformation, for example, metabolism to protect reactive metabolites or non-enzymatic hydrolysis to non-reactive products play in respiratory sensitization and how well is this handled in the in silico and in vitro models described? I'll take that first, I think. Um, I think it, it is quite important. I think you've got, um, you've got things that get oxidized, you've got things that get biotransformed. You, I mean, the, the classic example we have in the in the data set is formaldehyde releases. There's a whole series of chemicals that get, you know, they release formaldehyde um, and they then are, are, are respiratory sensitizers. I think part of the problem with answering that question is that our data set's fairly limited. Um, so we understand the sorts of biotransformations that we're perhaps familiar with in, in it from the skin analysis. Um, how big a problem it is, is quite tricky to say at the moment. But we, we do have biotransformations in the in the profiler, but not many. When I, talk, when I talk about the in vitro assays, now I cannot really talk about the GART assay, but as, uh, as they mainly use dendritic cells, or practically use dendritic cells alone, I don't expect a lot. Uh, coming to our model, because we have four cell lines and we know that the lung has a high capacity at least for certain uh, type of compounds to biotransform them like the P451A1 uh, etc they are highly expressed in lungs in vivo 
Um, we did some work on it and we did not see a lot and definitely did not real let's say, enzyme activity. And the literature is a bit different. Some people say yes, some people say no. Um, and I'm not aware that anybody has really tested uh, the whole battery of cytochromes uh, and their presence in A549, for example, the most commonly used lung cell line. So it, I would guess that the um, metabolic activity is definitely lower, if not much lower than in vivo. Okay. Um, another question. Are there merits to using a hybrid approach that involves both QSAR and in vitro test systems? Yes, definitely. I think the more evidence you can build, the better. I would say the same. And I think that's also because I'm sure that if you look on the in vitro assays alone, we have now two that are very promising. Uh, what my personal hope is that uh, it seems in the moment that both of them have a high sensitivity, accuracy, etc. They will have false positive, false negative. My personal hope is that they are based on slightly different principles, that maybe the combined results exclude almost all false results. That would be a perfect situation. And if you then get the additional input for a screening from in silico, that would also be good because at the end also in vitro work is not cheap. Yeah, I, I think I, I tried to allude to that with my analysis of, of the DPRA assay in that once you start to put in some structural activity, you might pick up some of the metabolic transformations, you might be able to pick through some of the false positives and false negatives. Um, anything that builds your weight of evidence has, has got to be good. Okay, thank you. Um, Arna, there's a question here for you asking if you have tested any metals in the vitreous all model. No, not yet. We thought about trying nickel at one time, but we have not sprayed any metal yet. We have quite some experience on, let's say, diesel and diesel related materials. We have done and published silver nanoparticles, and we have done and published some known respiratory sensitizers and irritants, but not specifically, let's say, metals except silver nanoparticles where you get silver ions. So then there's a similar question to that, which is, have there been any studies based on solid particles? And I think. Yes, there is a paper from a few months ago on in particle and fiber toxicology, free for download from our group. So we had the silver nanoparticles, silver particles, spherical ones, two, and silver nanowires. And you see also differences in the effects on, on this lung cell culture model. Okay, um, there's another question. If a chemical has an EC3 value less than 0.1% and is very reactive, would that be a concern for respiratory sensitization? So it's got an EC3 value of less than 0.1%. I think it would depend on its, so it's pretty potent in the, I think it would depend on the lysine cysteine ratio in, in my world, because you can be quite reactive towards a soft electrophile. So you could be very cysteine reactive um, and not very lysine reactive. So this idea that it would depend on the chemistry of the molecule. And that's kind of what the structure activity is trying to get at is that reactivity alone is not always going to be enough because you could be very reactive towards cysteine and not very reactive towards lysine. If you were very reactive towards both, I think you'd be concerned. Um, if you were very reactive towards cysteine, but not very reactive towards lysine, and you weren't able to cross link, then I don't think you'd be concerned. And I think that's where the the chemistry ratio idea of cysteine to lysine is really quite nice. And I, I quite like the work of, of John Lalco and co-workers. And then the idea about what other factors might push us across this threshold, this threshold of sensitization that we seem to need to get past. So I think it's more subtle than reactivity, you know, reactivity on its own. You've, I think you've got to look at the cysteine-lysine ratio. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Um, based on the anatomy depicted in the slides, sensitization primarily occurs in the alveolar space. Is it fair to say then that a particle that does not reach the deep lung but does contain a concentration of respiratory sensitizer may not induce sensitization? Could the in vitro assay confirm this assumption in any way or are they focused on alveolar cells? Um, uh, that's an interesting question. I have not presented today, let's say, the available models for the bronchial region um, simply because most of uh, the mechanisms leading to respiratory sensitization are described for the alveolar region. There are at least two companies providing human primary, uh, very complex cell culture models, Epitelix uh, in Europe and Matec in the US. And they have been used uh, a lot for particle research, chemical research. And I think it would be very interesting to test uh, the three or the four assays with, uh, with particles specifically made uh, for, for the purpose to answer this question. But I'm not sure that anybody has done it yet. And then there's a really similar question to that, Arno, which is to which regions of the respiratory tract can the LIST model be applied? And would you expect differences of the cell responses, say, between the, the thorax and the alveoli? Uh, our model is strictly alveolar, uh, that's clear, and partly also because we knew already that there are these two companies providing excellent bronchial models for the upper region. So in that way, we, we are restricted with our model for, to any effect uh, that you would expect and see in the alveolar region. Okay, um, there's a question here. In humans, are certain people genetically predisposed to being responsive to respiratory sensitizers? If the question goes to me, uh, I think uh, that's at least that we have this indication that it's like this. Uh, at the same time, the, essay, the essays that I presented today they are all based on cell lines, meaning they are not representing primary material, not representing the genetic background, not representing any pre-deceased state that may be favoring the development of a certain um, reaction in form of sensitization or anything else. Um, you have to see these assays as a more standardized approach, maybe for chemical screening. And then you, you, one can imagine to, de to develop based on primary patient material uh, assays. The issue is that, to my knowledge, also supported by it's a personal communication from industry, that there is in the moment an issue that human alveolar cells from primary material are extremely difficult to handle. That's why also no primary based uh, model is on the market. I think based on the, the clinical data that we have access to, that you'd have to imagine that that's the case, that certain individuals are more likely to be, to be sensitized than others. I mean, the clinical reports you see would suggest that. It's not like you're seeing vast numbers. Um, I think exposure as well. I mean, you know, diacocyanides are a classic. And it, the level of exposure an individual is, is exposed to will also matter. Okay, a um, couple more questions here. Um, so one would expect that the number of respiratory sensitizers relative to the number of respiratory irritants would be low. Any comments? Yes, I, I think, think I'd probably agree what, with that. Yes, me too. I mean, there is this list I of, let's say, 100, 100, maybe 120 chemicals that are at least in one or the other case in humans described being as uh, respiratory sensitizers while there's a large number of irritants. Yeah, completely agree with that. And the the structure activity analysis of that data set supports that in that the, the true number of sensitizers that 
tick all the biological boxes is going to be much lower. I mean, many of the chemicals in that data set, and remember when you collect human data you're, and you ask clinicians for it, you're typically getting um, occupational asthma as your, as your kind of end point. Many of those chemicals are, are definitely irritants rather than sensitizers. Uh, and that's my, the main criticism of, of, of the profiler, and that's where it needs refining is down to drill down and build the biological support for, for those that are truly sensitizers. I think we still need to work that chemistry out a little bit and finesse it slightly. Okay. Um, what about cysteine cross-linking agents potential for respiratory sensitization? What was the what was the question? Sorry, Christy. It's what about cysteine cross-linking agents potential for respiratory sensitization? Yeah, I didn't mention the ability of of sulfur-based um, chemicals to cause respiratory sensitization. We definitely have some examples in the data set where the cross-linking and the reactivity is, is disulfite-like. So, you know, chemicals with thiol on them can definitely react with sulfur and cross-link. Um, we have examples that are quite sparse in terms of the, the coverage and the number of chemicals, but they're definitely in there and, and I think you'd be concerned about them, but I think they need biological support. That's one of the areas where I'd, some of the ongoing work would be really useful to see where those chemicals truly are, the respiratory sensitizers or not, and the other biology parts support that. Okay. Um, here's a specific question. Is formaldehyde more of a respiratory irritant or a respiratory sensitizer? Again, a great question. Um, there is evidence in the literature that formaldehyde can cross-link proteins. It's quite, it's quite an extensive literature around protein cross-linking for formaldehyde. So we've, in the past, assumed that it, again, it has the potential to covalently cross-link, therefore, you might think it's going to be a, a respiratory sensitizer. However, this is one of those scenarios where what you're looking for when you review the alert as work goes forward is what's the biological support? What are those biomarkers that were alluded to before? Can they help us pick apart whether it really is an irritant or a sensitizer? Um, so yeah, that's a really interesting example of where we need to do quite a bit more work. What I can add to this is it's a very interesting compound to work in vitro with because what we saw is you use a um, formaldehyde concentration that will kill your epithelial layer A509 alone completely. If you have the tetraculture system with the three or four cell types, the same concentration does not even induce a decrease in cell viability which means that these multi-cell culture models are much more resilient to, let's say, chemical stress than single cell culture models, which was by itself a very interesting observation. Okay, uh, the next question. Um, the, the LIST model distinguishes between protein sensitizers and chemical sensitizers while Steve's paper focused on bonding to proteins. Are there respiratory sensitizers where protein interactions are not relevant? There's definitely respiratory, so we, when, in our work, we've looked at what was called chemical, what we would call chemical sensitizers in this, this discussion. There's definitely literature on non-covalent interactions um, where you, you know, you're not forming a bond we haven't done any work to, to define the SAR around those chemicals, but there are definitely examples of that. Yeah. Well, yeah, we have actually not specifically looked into it. It was more by chance that in a small cooperation with friends, we were asked to test uh, these proteins. And you see also from, from this one slide where if you look on the results on these 11 endpoints that uh, is completely different, which means whatever happens, it's not triggering the same pathway, which means probably also the 
the protein really does something different than a chemical, which is in a way to be expected. Okay, thank you. Um, a few more here. Um, what do you think about the similarities in chemicals that are skin sensitizers and DNA adduct inducers in ways that they both form covalent binding with proteins and DNAs? Any other similarities or differences you may speculate? I think if you ask it, if you ask the chemist that question, I, I think it's all it's all reactivity, and I think it's, I mean, I guess what you're getting at is can you use DNA evidence as as an as an example of hard electrophile reactivity? I mean, we've never looked at that. Um, you'd imagine some of the chemistry might be similar. It's nitrogen as the as the nuclear file. Um, you'd imagine some of the chemistry is going to overlap. Because you're talking about a similar nuclear file, if you're doing it in in the lab in vivo, I wouldn't like to speculate. Okay. Um, next up, we have a, a practical question, and Gino, hopefully you're listening listening because this one might be actually more for you. Um, for new chemical registration submissions. Would the EPA today likely accept any of the data from these in vitro test methods as a definitive means of discriminating between skin and respiratory sensitization, as opposed to the default stance today of declaring a skin sensitizer to also likely be a respiratory sensitizer? Unfortunately, I am listening, and thank you for the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is a good question. and. Uh, um, I, I I can't say anything definitively. Obviously, a submitter can bring whatever case they believe they have, and we will make we will look at it. I, I found today's both presentations really uh, exciting and informative, and I think it just goes to show you how far we've come and how far we have to go. So uh, I don't think we can definitively say yes to uh, that kind of a question but we also don't want to discourage folks from not presenting to us the best available information that they have and, and how they look at their own chemistries. And then there's a really similar question since you're speaking, Gino, about using skin sensitization as a proxy for respiratory sensitization and the, the number of false positives produced by that assumption. Is there a better proxy that EPA could use, I think? would probably be the same answer for that one. It would be, but I do think that we, uh, at least uh, I, I think everyone understands how uh, this policy may be viewed by folks on the outside, and, and it is a simple way to look at it, but, you know, n n it's time to rethink it, and we're open to ideas, too. Um, so but we, I understand, and, and, and that's also a good point. Great, thanks, Gino, for jumping in. All right, and we have, oh, um, and then to follow up on that question, um, the same person asked what the speakers think, if there's a, a different or better proxy that could be used. I think you're in the zone exactly as, as was just mentioned in that, you know, we know that skin is gonna be over predictive of respiratory. I, I think you're going to have to build a case. I mean, I'm I'm a chemist, not a regulator, so I think you've got to build a case, haven't you, with the alternatives? I think it would depend on your area of chemical space. If you were confident, you know, you could look at a skin result, and if you were confident that it ticks some of these boxes in an in vitro assay and some structural alert work, then maybe you would be more confident. Um, I think it's difficult though. Yeah, I have a colleague working uh, in Europe, uh, partly for ECA, uh, European Chemical Agency, and I, I, I think that's also they, in difficult cases, they depend on the material and the information that is available, and it, then this is done on a case-by-case -case approach. Yeah, because you've got you've got other complicating factors that you know, if, 
as, you, as was alluded to previously, if you've got a you know a nanoparticle or a mixture, then none of this stuff that I've talked about is going to help you. Um, and then you might you may well still be relying on the local lymph node assay, which is obviously less than ideal. All right, thanks. Um, we still have two questions here if no more come in. Um, one is, is there an indication of potency based on SAR protein cross-linking data or from the clinician's observations with occupational asthma cases? That's a good question. Um, my feeling here is that the best indication of reactivity you're going to get from the SAR is going to be about rates of covalent bond from formation, which you don't get from the DPRA, unfortunately. The data we got from the clinicians was very much, you know, yes, no sort of sort of events. You know, it's reports from occupational exposure, a worker sent to see the doctor because they've, you know, developed a cough or whatever, those sorts of things. So that's very much binary uh, potential data. We have looked at trying to rank um, potential respiratory sensitizers, but the problem that you have is you don't have a gold standard animal assay of historical data to go back to like you do with the local lymph node data for skin. So you know with skin, if you group things into mechanisms, you can start to predict potency. Here, we don't have that fallback position of, of that historical data set, so it is quite difficult. But having said all of that, I think a, a, an experienced chemist can look at some of these chemicals, if it's a single chemical scenario, and suggest to you that one's going to be very reactive, you know, and then you might get into some looking at perhaps the local lymph node assay historical data to give you some guidance about how potent it's likely to be. But it's it's very difficult because you don't have a data set to go back to of, of you know potency information for the for the respiratory tract. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, next up, is there a way to differentiate between sensitization and multiple chemicals sensitivity? I don't think I understand the question. I, I don't think I understand the question either. <laughs> Arno, you don't have any insights on that? No. Probably the question covers this uh, kind of chronic fatigue syndrome, multiple chemical uh, exposure syndrome, or what it's called. But I have no opinion from my in vitro assays about that. Okay. Okay, then there is one last question. Um, are respiratory sensitizers always dermal sensitizers? If you're looking at low molecular weight chemicals, the sorts of things we've looked at in the profiler, then the vast majority of the ones we've looked at, if they're if they're if they're respiratory sensitizers, then they are normally skin sensitizers as well. It's the other way around that's the problem. The assumption that everything is skin is going to cause respiratory. Certainly in the data that we've looked at, that's that's been the case. I would add to this maybe also from the practical point of view, in these cases you come to the point that in reality in the field situation most people will not be exposed only to either or. So then it's very difficult to differentiate in vivo where it comes from. There is this nice picture and it's very in presentation where they show a worker with a fully protected uh, face mask with uh, oxygen on his back, etc., and then he's working in t-shirt and shorts spraying something. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because the amount of evidence there is in the literature that respiratory sensitization is induced through the skin is is quite high. It's quite a, a wealth of evidence to suggest that that induction can occur through the skin. So I think obviously the two are quite you know, link quite quite closely. Okay, and one more came in, so we'll finish on this one. For low vapor pressure chemicals used in non-aerosol generating applications, 
How significant is the risk to triggering respiratory sensitization? I think the vapor question, pressure question is quite interesting because the analysis that we've done of looking at the, the sort of trying to use vapor pressure to, to discriminate between a skin and a respiratory sensitizer suggests that it's not a very good way of discriminating. Um, so I, 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 you know, there were some examples in, in you know, the, some of the dyes are not very volatile and they still cause respiratory sensitization. So it, I think it'd be tricky. I wouldn't like to rely on volatility alone as my distinguishing factor. Okay, well, I would like to wrap up here. Thank you so much to our speakers as well as everybody who called in today. Um, as I, as Christy mentioned at the beginning, we will post the webinars, um, both this recording as well as the slides online at the, the website on the screen. And we're hoping to have another webinar in the, the next couple months. So also keep an eye out on that web page for future webinars in this series. So again, thank you all for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. you.